Every summer, people come to the Willow Tree Club picnic from all over the Washington area. For many, it's a reunion. Many of these people used to live in a small area of Washington, D.C. called Southwest. <laughs> Oh, it was nice. The houses in it. Yeah. Oh, we knew each other, but when a stranger come around, I don't know nobody. <laughs> we didn't have to leave Southwest to buy nothing. We had everything down there. Right, amen. Everything. Sure Shoes, clothes, everything. everything. Now we got to ride up town to get it. There's been such a change down there and there. All the old things that we know about is gone now. That's for one thing. Every fall, St. Dominic's Church has a reunion for parishioners who lived in the Old Southwest. It's called Heritage Day. Southwest is the smallest of the four quadrants that make up Washington, D.C. When efforts began in the late 40s to clean up inner city slums, Southwest was selected as the first area for redevelopment because it contained the worst slums in the city. The project began as an effort to clean up the slums, provide better housing, and upgrade the community. It ended by changing the face and character of Southwest forever. The community was bulldozed, then rebuilt. 23,000 people and 1,400 businesses were displaced. The era of urban renewal had begun. Hornhead Street really is a beautiful street, even though uh, in those days it seemed to be a joke in Vaudeville, but it ran from what we call the Arsenal, which is really Fort McNair, straight north and south up through the park. And it was a very wide street with cobblestones, streetcars, tracks in the middle, great big century elms on both sides of the street. These elms were so big that they almost met in the center of the street. You'd look down in the middle of the street, you could just see white uh, sky and little blue clouds occasionally. We had trains coming in and big, big markets, a big fish market and a big produce market, and um, big boats coming into the pier. And it was really a, a, a seaport then. But Southwest had uh, the, 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 the smaller clubs, the boats. We had the, the Wilson Line. And uh, we'd go to Southwest to the Wilson Line. We went to Southwest to get the seafood. Uh, there were big, fantastically marvelous homes. Uh, we had Delaware Avenue, you know. Well, there was a real camaraderie ship in Southwest. Now, we were very close, we were very friendly, very nosy now, I'm not gonna make a deal. Everybody knew everybody's business. But it was such a thing that they used to tell a tale about um, if someone wanted to go uptown, they would leave the pot on the stove and say, well, would you mind going in there and turn my pot off when it, the when it food gets done? At that time, they used to walk and beat the police. The uh, number four precinct, uh, the cop on a beat would always come up to the office, chat a while, the, uh, uh, somebody uh, needed financing, they'd go downstairs to Lloyd Lott Turner's office. Everybody knew everyone in the vicinity. Uh, children were free to go in and out of any house, and the mothers weren't worried because they knew they were being taken care of. 
I remember how delighted we were when we found that we had our own uh, hamburger place. That was brand new for Southwest. A fellow named Bill ran it, Bill's Grill. And there were little nightclubs, restaurants. Let's see. We used to say to some people that, some of the chaps, that they never went north of Pennsylvania Avenue in whole lives. Didn't need to except to go to high school. But 4th Street seemed to have been more or less a borderline from 4th Street back to the waterfront, 7th Street. And uh, the, the, the population of whites was just it's about as many as blacks from 4th Street over to South Capitol. It was just about 50-50 at that particular time. Well, the whites and blacks got along all right. A bit wary of each other. But the white kids who lived near black kids played with them. As a rule, they were the uh, shopkeepers' children. But they didn't go to school together. Sometimes the white kids would go to the black theaters with the black kids. But of course, that wasn't recipro reciprocated. And I remember Mr. Brent one time, ever so often one of the white kids with the with the colored kids would come over to the playground, Mr. Brent would run the white kids away. Not that she wanted to, but she had to. When you finish your singing, you come in the back way. And when you finish your singing, you go out in the kitchen. You couldn't mingle. It, it, the, the people wanted, but the owners didn't. Some of the people wanted to mingle with the entertainers, but they didn't want that, you know. Billy Bortney. Though that was a very nice uh, restaurant, seafood restaurant. We couldn't go in. But he had a nice outside window that we went to, and you could go there and get a sandwich, which you could divide up among three and a big orange soda. Uh, I didn't have this privilege of doing this so much. I was kept a little close, but uh, I understand a lot of them that used to go there. And where you going? They walked to Billy Borden and get these sandwiches. Finally, they put up the Cadillac. That was another uh, seafood place that uh, we could uh, go and get uh, carry out food. But the rest of them, we just... You, could, you just didn't go in them. You weren't allowed to go in. The halls was down on, I forget, it was a very exclusive place. And, you know, you, it was just one of the things at the time that uh, we knew we couldn't go in. But we had our own place. We had mics. John Rhines and I got together uh, on that occasion, and we decided that we would have a, a community parade celebrating the renaming and the, uh, and the repaving of Four and a Half Street and the change, when changing the name to Fourth Street. And so we put on the first integrated parade in Washington. Well, we used to go to Reds and drink beer and look at the stage show. The guy, what was that guy? Clad, was it Clyde McFadden? McFadden, what is it? It was his brother or his cousin. And during intermission, we'd go across the street to uh, um, uh, Reverend Kelsey's church and he'd pick feet and watermelon because he used to have the food, you know, in the tent. And we'd stay there a while, and after intuition, we'd go back to the beer garden. But Reverend Kelsey was a man who used to sing a song that he would attract everybody. Sing, I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. Little boy, how old are you, little boy? How old are you, little boy? How old are you? I'm only 10 years old. Reverend Kelsey moved his church to Northwest Washington. And where the Boeing School is sitting now, southwest. That's where that old tent was stretched. It was a vacant lot. We had old raggedy tent. Praise the Lord, amen. There were over 20 churches in the old southwest. Among them, Metropolitan Wesley AME Zion, Bethel Pentecostal Tabernacle, Friendship Baptist, and Fifth Baptist. St. Dominic's was the oldest. The original church building was constructed in the early 1850s. Called upon to find land for a federal city where America's legislators could meet, America's first president selected a site 16 miles up the Potomac River from his home in Virginia. 
Pierre L'Enfant was hired to design the new federal city, which later was named Washington, D.C. Early speculative building took place in Southwest during the 1700s. Wheat Row, the city's first row house group, was among the many projects built by a group of real estate developers headed by James Greenleaf. The syndicate thought Southwest was going to become the most important part of Washington due to its closeness to the capital and Potomac waterfront. But the new city grew to the north, and the Greenleaf Syndicate was bankrupt by 1796. By 1815, a canal had been built linking Georgetown with the Anacostia River. The canal physically cut off Southwest from the rest of the city. Southwest soon became known by its long-standing nickname, the Island. Although the canal was later filled in during the 1870s, the artificial border was replaced by railroad lines along Maryland and Virginia avenues. A federal penitentiary was built at the military fort in Southwest, causing a sense of further isolation. The slave trade operated there. Black men, women, and children were bought and sold at slave pens. At least two slave pens were active in Southwest. The Underground Railroad also operated in Southwest. Many people, both black and white, helped slaves escape through this secret transport system that crisscrossed the country. Southwest was extremely busy during the Civil War. It was a major embarkation point for troops and supplies for several Union offensives. Munitions were manufactured at the military arsenal and a hospital operated on the mall. After the war, thousands of freed slaves poured into Washington, D.C. Many settled in Southwest. Numerous alley dwellings were constructed and rented to low-income families. The majority of renters were freed people who had immigrated to D.C. from the former slave states. Isolated from the rest of the capital, Southwest became a city within a city. Although Southwest was a self-sufficient community, it was economically depressed. An influx of poor Jewish and Italian immigrants from Europe had begun in the late 1800s. They too could not afford the more affluent areas of the city and settled in Southwest. Sam Rosenberg's mother and father moved to Southwest in the early 1890s. According to Mr. Rosenberg, practically the first thing his father did was to get together with other Jews to form the Talmud Torah Synagogue. Their next-door neighbors were the Jolsons, whose son, Asa, later became Al Jolson. Well, my father had a tailoring establishment on Pennsylvania Avenue between 9th and 10th Street, about exactly where the Department of Justice is now. Right around the corner on Louisiana Avenue was a small... Vorderville House. Al Jolson used to come up and bother my father off and on. So one day, Papa said he gave him a nickel, told him to go to the theater and stop bothering him. And he did. And the nickel admitted you to the gallery. And uh, Al was up there. And someone on stage was singing. And Al joined in. And it sounded so good that the manager sent an usher up to get Al, bring him down on the stage to join in the act, and he act, did and actually joined the show. Uh, seems he left town with the show, too. His family was practically crazy. And uh, he came home a couple of days later. Seems a troop went to Baltimore. Anyway, Papa says he was on a streetcar going to work, and Al got on, and... Uh, and uh, he says, look, Mr. Rosenberg, I'm an actor. And Papa says, he told him, he said, you're a bummer, you go home. But he didn't listen to him. <laughs> he really was an actor. Bruce Walls was really home base. If you wanted to go see a show, that's where you went. You went to Bruce's. It was Mike Wilson's at first. And then uh, it later it turned over to Bruce Walls. But Bruce's was home. He made you feel good. And there's nothing in the world better than going into Bruce's and hearing Mom and Lily say, all right, what do you, okay, can't sit up there. Gotta eat something, right? Pearl 
Thomas and Laura Petaway performed in Southwest beginning in the 1930s. I know I ain't good looking on you. Don't believe I'm a jockey, just bank your mule into my soul. Well, I may be old up in years, not too old to ship again. Guess I'll go back home. Mary Jefferson performed there beginning in the 1940s. Sometimes, yes, it does. He may be your man, but he comes to see me sometimes. Lord, he's coming so often, I swear I think he's mine. Not far from Bruce's was Harrigan's, a place as diverse as Southwest itself. Morris Engel operated Harrigan's. We had fishermen, people who lived on the waterfront, Socialites who lived on the waterfront and had boats. Then slowly the art colony started drifting in. Harrigan's was the last building in the Old Southwest to be torn down. Age has a way of uh, throwing a golden haze over everything. I look back right now, I think the Army was a pretty nice place. I know very well it wasn't. At least a good bit of it wasn't. But. Nature just seems to make things look a little better, in retrospect. And I think there are many of us who look back at the nice things of Southwest the same way our parents looked back at the good old days in the 90s. The good old days weren't good, and everything in Southwest wasn't good either. But it was a friendly place. It was a place where all of us knew each other. And we very seldom managed to surprise each other. And there was a lot of helping caring and sharing, although not quite as much as some people want you to believe. Now, my father, as an ice man and a coal man, we would go through all of them. He had customers in these alleys, and therefore I had to, uh, I had to, I had uh, to go with him in these alleys and visit the homes in these alleys. And the people lived poorly there, very poorly in these alleys. They were more or less like huts. Some of them was practically falling down. They was just condemned places. I thought that they had a, a glorious history until one of the parish council members who was here for a long time said, no, in the early 30s, the parish started to decline, and then which was an indication of the real condition that led to the urban redevelopment. I remember reading about the slums behind the capital, and that was a very revealing thing not to to know that right in the, in the neighborhood of the capital and in the shadow of the capital, there was all this poverty, abject poverty. The slums in Southwest were the worst in Washington, D.C. Death rates from tuberculosis were two and one half times the rate for the entire city. Other diseases were correspondingly high. Most of the housing had outside toilets, no central heating, and no inside baths. The slums covered about 80 acres of the 560 acres that make up Southwest. There was a very active uh, medical center in Southwest run by the city. And the director of this medical center for a long time was uh, Dr. John Pate. And uh, Pate, court, of course, saw the, well, what he considered at least to be the consequences of poor housing on families because patients came to him with all kinds of diseases and problems which at least on the surface appeared to be attributable to the living condi conditions in which they lived. And he was uh, very anxious to see it cleared up. And one of the devices he used uh, very often was to invite members of Congress to come visit his center and while they were there, well, he was very proud of his center, I think we had a new building at the time, and while they were there he invited them to visit with him around the neighborhood and he uh, often took them to an outside toilet and of course if it was the summertime the flies were all over the place 
and he reminded them that these were the same flies that uh, came and dropped uh, on the windowsills of the House and Senate office buildings when the senators were having lunch in their offices. And uh, he thought, anyway, and maybe it was, a very persuasive argument to get the kind of support which was required. And you remember that at that time, the District of Columbia was under the total control of the federal government and the U.S. Congress. In 1945, Congress passed a Housing Act that directed the National Capital Park and Planning Commission to survey slum areas. The act also created a federal redevelopment agency that would direct Washington's renewal activities. It was called the District of Columbia Redevelopment Land Agency. By the early 1950s, a redevelopment effort to clean up Washington's slums was well underway. A citywide survey found southwest slums the worst. The area was designated Project B and targeted for immediate redevelopment. The Redevelopment Land Agency purchased the first southwest property in December of 1953. In April of 1954, the walls of Dixon Court tumbled down as city and federal officials watched. The demolition of Washington's most notorious alley marked the real beginning of the redevelopment of Southwest. Um, many of the people were not unaware of the fact that they lived in an area which was sometimes highly dangerous and certainly not ideal for raising children. And I hasten to add that this wasn't true for the whole of Southwest or the whole of Project B. But it was an image that was the image which had been portrayed to much of the city and an image which many of the people who live in the Southwest had of their own neighborhoods. And I don't think there's any question about that. The slum clearance effort went smoothly until a hardware store owner challenged the U.S. government. Goldie Schneider claimed that even though her property was in the redevelopment area, it could not be taken because it was not a slum. The case ended up in the U.S. Supreme Court as Berman versus Parker. The court ruled that the property could be taken. This, this case, Supreme Court case has been in, in law school case books. Uh, they went a long way. They have given the government and, and probably state governments too, a carte blanche in any area of the country to take any property uh, for uh, almost any reason. Once they decide the taking, whether to beautify the area, uh, whether to clear slums, uh, for many, many reasons, uh, they could take it, condemn it, and they say your only right is to just compensation under the Fifth Amendment. The Supreme Court decision cleared the way for increased redevelopment activities. The scope of the Southwest Project grew by leaps and bounds. A key player in the project's expansion was New York developer William Zeckendorf. Redevelopment land agency studies began to show that the entire southwest area was going downhill. Soon, efforts were made to expand the redevelopment area to include all of southwest. I was getting tired. My son was working with me then. I was thinking about the future. There were rumors about redevelopment entering the southwest. I didn't own the building, I only rented it, and uh, I knew it would wipe me out. One of the first buildings to be closed down in the redevelopment was St. Dominic School, which was a sign that redevelopment was going, in effect, take place, and the fact that people started to move out of the area. The Redevelopment Land Agency made efforts to inform the community of the impending changes. Community meetings were held. Mr. Searles announced that he would speak to all the citizens, all the members of the Southwest Civic Association, so we scared everybody into coming. And that night at Randall, the place was packed, standing room only. <clears throat> Mr. Searles was there, and any number of other people were there. And I was the one who introduced Mr. Searles. And at one point, I asked Mr. Searles, as I recall, I said, Mr. Searles, <clears throat> is Southwest going to be redeveloped so that most of the people here would be able to afford to return. Mr. Searles looked at me as though I was something that had crawled out from under a rock. He said, why, of course. That's the whole idea. And as I said, I felt very bad. And redevelopment land agency social workers made house calls to residents. And see, when they came to me, I was, uh, I didn't see Mr. Banks at this time, but I, I knew he was in the area. 
It was a social worker, a black social worker, and a tall white guy with a attache case. And over the years, not knowing what's going on in the tradition of a child, where your parents teach you that they have your theirs and you have yours, you're not aware of what's going on. You're just scared to hear come a white man with a attache case, but. Uh, sophisticated black woman saying that uh, we're going to give you a place to stay. You have to move out this unit. Members of the Redevelopment Land Agency would come into my restaurant to eat, eat there, and I met them and became very friendly with them. And uh, they painted a beautiful picture of the New Southwest. But I realized that their idea of a beautiful picture was in contrast to what the businessman who was going to be displaced Oh, they had pamphlets on this little village of these lovely little houses that you can move into. You're going to have transportation. It's going to be a supermarket. It's going to be a clinic. It's going to be a theater. You're going to have everything you want in this little village. Displaced Southwest residents often were compensated for less than their property was worth. The woman across the street from us whose husband was dead and she had six children. And they had a nice home that they had kept up and... Uh, it had about four or five bedrooms, which they really needed. And when she was put out of her home, they gave her $10,000. And I don't know where she could have gone and gotten another home that would be big enough for her. It was my feeling that when there was a tornado or a storm or a flood or some other catastrophe occurred in a given area, the government would provide disaster relief. It was my feeling that when the government itself was responsible for putting a, a derrick into, and raising a given area, it was similar to this natural destructiveness, and that they should make some provision to help these displaced businessmen to relocate elsewhere. Well, there was a big stink about raising these people out. And they, Congress finally passed a law where they had to pay uh, moving expenses of these people up to two or $3,000, I forget. Because these people were being uprooted. Not only owners, but renters were being uprooted from their homes. And it's not easy to move. So it's expensive to move. They told me I could come back to the area where I live. I would just be moving in this little village temporarily until they complete, the, renovate the units. And I said, well, what's happened to these houses that's been torn down over here? Oh, don't worry about them. They were old wooden shacks, but these are strong brick houses. We're not going to tear these down. We're just going to move you out to the village, and you will enjoy the village, and when we finish renovating your house, you can come back. When they got through, practically everyone in Southwest in the redevelopment area, in fact, everyone in the redevelopment areas was moved out, and uh, very few of those who were there originally could afford to come back unless they qualified for public housing or had some very fancy incomes. The goal of urban renewal, as understood by the public, was to modernize, to bring up to date um, a community. And so we have to do something. We've got to clear the slums, put better housing so that people will li live in decency. That was one goal. There are people who say that the renewal program originally promised that they would be able to return. And as I said in the beginning, when renewal was being considered at first, it was thought that that what would be possible, not only would be possible, but that the only use of Southwest because of the image it had would be for low and moderate income families. And the other goal was to try to improve the tax base of the community. When outsiders like Ralph Bush looked at the area and its proximity to the Capitol and the White House and the river, they saw more potential. And it was on the basis of their having seen more potential that gradually the public officials began to realize that this was a much more valuable and strategic area as far as total city interests were concerned than they had originally thought. When St. Dominic's had to face it, the redevelopment, there was a challenge first that the, there was a plan first that the freeway would be 
built through the church. And per lo the parishioners and uh, got a little assistance from Congress and decided that the urban renewal plan could be changed to protect such a historical and monumental building. Land set aside in the redevelopment plan for moderate income housing was given to St. Dominic's to build a new school. Well, it was a pretty bad time of watching your close friends and neighbors move away, or rather be forced to, not really move away of their own free will. And then to sit and watch the homes being torn down was just unbelievable pain. And then you had the, the problem of the many, many dogs and cats roaming the neighborhood because they were left behind and they had no one to feed them, so they became wild packs of animals. And you had the rat problem with the homes being torn down. And the debris that was left, they left piles of debris when they would tear down the homes and uh, cart off anything that was usable. And then they would set these on fire and they would burn for days and days. And sometimes the fire department came and put them out, but generally they were just left to burn. It was a pretty bad time. It was almost like being in a war area and having everything torn down around you. Uh, I was the last one to leave on our block, so I saw all of the destruction going on around us. And it was something I wouldn't want to live through again. I can't ever remember when we didn't have an herbal renewal. renewal. It was always over our heads that we were going to have to move. Uh, and we were going to have to, you know. And we were wanted to, but it's been so long drawn out. Well, they bring a new director in here of the RLA, and uh, Mr. Searles was a wonderful man. And we had wonderful plans with him. And then he went away, and somebody else came, and then we had to get another lot of plans. and. We were just worn down with <laughs> changes. Never could get uh, us anything going. And then if you'd plan on something, the time everybody looked it over and approved it, and they, well, you just couldn't get anything approved. It, and we'd, for 10 years, we, we sat there trying to get across the street. We bought land and had plans for a place on South Capitol Street because we didn't think we'd ever get back in the, in, on the waterfront. Delayed also was the suburban-type shopping mall that planners hoped would provide all of the shopping facilities needed by Southwest residents. The shopping mall was to be surrounded by residential housing. The project was called Town Center and planned by William Zeckendorf. It was approved by the Redevelopment Land Agency and was to be built by Zeckendorf's company, Webb and Knapp. Another Webb and Knapp project was L'Enfant Plaza, which was designed by the now world-famous architect I.M. Pei. Zeckendorf and the Redevelopment Land Agency had high hopes for L'Enfant Plaza. They envisioned it as a cultural center for the entire city. Although Zeckendorf was a motivating force from the early stages of the Southwest renewal, his plans ran into barrier after barrier. He claimed the biggest of these was having to deal with 13 separate governmental agencies. Webb and Knapp's problems were not limited to Southwest. Zeckendorf would complete only two of the apartment buildings in the town center complex before his company went bankrupt. His Southwest properties were sold and developed but they did not turn out as he had planned. The town center idea did not work. Then the developer of the mall was a developer who uh, just seemed to engender problems. Uh, he had problems with the buildings he built, the, um, the uh, rental buildings, residential buildings, and he had lots of problems with the mall. The developer of Town Center asked the Redevelopment Land Agency to modify the plan so that he could include office buildings in the mall complex. The agency finally agreed to the plan change. Now office buildings, instead of apartment buildings, surround Waterside Mall. We don't have, we don't have the shopping facilities we had in Old Southwest. We don't have the 
type of barbershop we used to have. We don't have the farmer's market. We don't have the wharf where they used to have the different, uh, used to cook the fresh fish like Benny Barclays and Cadillacs, capping or uh, restaurants. We don't have the theaters we used to have. We don't have the, uh, what is that, the ballroom? The ballroom we used to go and dance. Though Law Firm Plaza was also constructed, it did not become the cultural enclave Zeckendorf had envisioned. Since the concert hall was built in another part of the city, L'Enfant Plaza is virtually empty at night. Despite delays and difficulties, the new Southwest began to emerge. Buildings went up and people moved in. The new community offered beautiful apartment complexes with swimming pools and the convenience of being close to the center of the city. Many of the buildings won architectural awards. The new Southwest offered the city's first integrated housing. The community was brand new, with a new look and new ideas, but it lacked moderate income housing. The original urban renewal plan included housing for an economically diverse community, but the constant plan changes had eliminated most of the middle income housing. Luxury apartment buildings had gone up next to public housing. Now, in the older Southwest, the residents who had some rather nice incomes were in constant contact with those who didn't have these incomes. And the kids who lived in the poor areas, or the poorer homes, could look a few blocks, up, a few doors up the street and see Dr. So-and-so, lawyer So-and-so, Mr. So-and-so, and feel that the gap wasn't insurmountable. If things went right, that could be me. But there's one a big psychological jump between public housing over here on Delaware Avenue and say our, uh, where I'm living now. I never come in contact with, with the kids around there. That all the upper income, middle in, well, it's really almost upper middle income people moved in to the urban renewal area when it was finished. And black kids and some white kids who lived, there were very few, but white, but who lived in public housing had to watch this. I used to see them walk past the swimming pools in summer and looking in and they'd see all these people, you know, in these gorgeous swimming pools and they didn't have, they didn't have a swimming pool. They couldn't swim in the Potomac anymore. It was so filthy. If we've learned anything over the years, it is that it's very hard to mix um, socioeconomic groups that you really cannot develop, unfortunately, as is true in other parts of the world, develop neighborhoods in which you have affluent people living next door to welfare clients. It's not a question of race, and I don't think the problem was one of race. It was not white and black. It was primarily low socioeconomic classes mixed with high economic classes, and that didn't work and doesn't work to this day. In 1970, when I was chairman of the assembly, the Redevelopment Land Agency told us that there was one parcel of land left, which we had not known about. It was not, for, it was not planned for housing. It had been planned for a church school, and St. Dominic's, the church, had relinquished the right to it, so it was available. And we immediately started the process of getting the plan change that would allow uh, modern income housing to be built there. And e. R. Quesada developed L'Enfant Plaza. To the plan, and that in order to change the plan, uh, if any party wished to change the plan, it would require the consent in writing of those who may be affected by the change. And we went through that whole business a uh, couple of years of hearings in the community and then hearings before the land aid Redevelopment Land Agency and the National Capital Planning Commission, the D.C. Council. Uh, soon after we were had a great big uh, $8 million hole dug in the ground, uh, they came up with a contention that uh, that provision didn't mean what we said it meant and what they had said it meant. When we completed it successfully and were ready to build, we had the architect and the plans were all finished and they were that. Um, the, uh, some of the neighbors to that parcel uh, went to court, 
along with Casada. Uh, it was a long, long, drawn-out suit, extremely expensive uh, to all of us, uh, and the U.S. District Court, before whom the uh, trial was conducted, uh, sided in our favor and against the RLA. We were unable to get uh, the, the uh, uh, plan change uh, uh, approved in the end. And with the Buzzard's point, we had the same objective, because there was all that free, there was quite a bit of free land, a very attractive site, beautiful site between the Potomac and the Anacostia and the rivers. They have built, they have built uh, gates. It looks like a monkey cage over on 201 I Street to keep our kids from going, cutting across the, uh, the area to go to the schools. They had built a brick wall over at uh, the Lemon and Block of Third, which we call it the Berlin Wall, so the kids wouldn't go through that, you know. It's not the warmness that it has been. Tensions between the different income groups continued to grow through the 1960s. Community leaders got together to talk about possible solutions. Some of the apartment complexes opened their swimming pools to neighborhood kids during certain hours. Tensions eased somewhat until old wounds were opened when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated and Washington, D.C. exploded with riots. During the riots, Southwest was a fairly protected neighborhood, primarily by the people in the low-income area, who are primarily black. There's a racial mix in the middle and upper income areas, but it's the people in the lower income areas that paroled the streets and kept the area safe. During that time, uh, there was a great, there started to be developed, there started to develop a, a good bit of mistrust. Uh, all of a sudden, people in the low income area who had been out at night in order to protect the area, uh, started hearing about people who were having guns in their apartments to protect themselves from uh, whatever evil was out there. And uh, then all of a sudden the people in the low-income area started deciding they would have guns. And uh, it was a very serious kind of barrier that started to exist. The community, start primarily through the Southwest Neighborhood Assembly, established a series of uh, workshops to deal with the issues of black-white relationships. Another solution explored by the Assembly was the initiation of a Southwest Arts Festival. By 1975, it was a well-established tradition. Margaret Royce helped plan the Arts Festival. Southwest Arts Festival is a marvelous thing, you know. This whole place is just swarming at that time. Everybody's dancing, bringing in food to sell, paintings, artworks, everything from all over the community. I think that's the, the, where it's been a success. But that, all of that was a result of the efforts of both the low-income and higher-income people who just were determined they were going to have a community. It didn't, wasn't easy. Residents forced out of Southwest by the Renewal Project relocated to areas all over Washington, D.C. and Maryland. A few moved to Virginia. Only a handful returned to Southwest. Dr. Daniel Thurs conducted a study on the impact of the relocation on former Southwest residents. So what we found uh, when we began to seek out a, a sample of the residents who had been moved out of southwest Washington as part of this massive effort. Uh, what we found did not at all meet my expectation. I thought that really because there was not enough change in the entire society and enough economic support that we would have simply dispersed um, the problems of a slum to other parts of the community. They were not living in slums. They were living in good, adequate housing. Uh, many of the problems that they had suffered from were gone. But what was more frightening to me was that in the process of moving them from Southwest, we had destroyed something which was even more important to them, namely the sense of community. 
the friendships, the support that existed in a rat-infested slum. We had forgotten that this was home to these people. And uh, as the study shows, five years after they left southwest Washington, 25% had not made a single friend. Uh, I don't think there were any evil intentions anywhere along the line in terms of pulling the wool over people's eyes or telling them things that weren't true. I think they unfolded here in Southwest a development which was different than it was originally conceived. Uh, we tried in all the ways that we knew how to make the change as painless and as untraumatic as possible for the people. I think we succeeded in the main. I know there were some we didn't, and I hope that uh, those who have undertaken to do this in, in more recent years have learned from some of the experiences we had. I think Southwest is, uh, has a great potential for being more than just a place where there are buildings next to buildings and residences next to residences and businesses next to businesses and churches interspersed. I think it is a, uh, a place that has a natural cohesion and a place that has uh, the potential for people to really be human with one another, to affirm human values of uh, relatedness, neighborhood, neighborliness, uh, development of uh, a facility to walk on the streets without fear, the possibility to develop recreational efforts that would be available to everyone. The new Southwest is still struggling to define itself. City and business officials are now developing a grand plan for Buzzards Point, an area along the Potomac largely neglected during the first wave of urban renewal. The Southwest story remains unfinished.